Hello everyone, uh, this is Shadi Reis from SIF 2023. I'm really privileged today to be with Dr. Richard Schlafmetz um, talking about coronary imaging. Dr. Schlafmetz, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you, thank you for taking the time to speak to me. So, imaging is something that really changed my professional life. I've been in practice since 1984, and I started doing imaging uh, religiously in the last 15 years. And I never met a cardiologist, an interventional cardiologist, who said they were mediocre. Everybody has great results, everyone does a great job. And I was that person. When I was doing angiography alone, I thought that, gee, um, I have great results, my patients are happy, I don't need anything more. And then my eyes opened up to imaging, and in the last decade and a half, it really changed how I practice, it changed how my whole hospital practices. And we use imaging 95% of the time because you realize that if you want to get the best result for your patient, you got to do it right the first time. And imaging lets you optimize with precision to get the best results for your patients. Yeah. We spoke about uh, how imaging changed your strategy of approaching a lesion, and there's some literature behind it. Yeah. Well, you know, you want to know the morphology of a, of a lesion. Is it lipid? Is it calcium? But if it's calcium, it's a little complicated. It's not just calcium. It's the types of calcium. Is it nodular? Is it protruding? Is it deformable or not deformable? And that's important because calcium is one of our enemies. And if you don't fracture that calcium so you can get full expansion of the stent, you're going to have a problem going forward, and then eventually the patient's going to be looking at surgery. Right. And how much percentage of the time the, the operator would change their algorithm of therapy if they do imaging? So, you know, people agree, at least in conferences, that imaging is important for calcium, for instant restenosis and left mains, but they say for simple lesions, it's not that important. But when you look at studies, 60 to 80% of the time, if you image quote unquote a simple lesion, it changed what you did afterwards. Yeah. And how about post imaging? So if you do it right beforehand with imaging, you, your optimization, your chance of dissection because you're landing in normal tissue, it doesn't change much often if you do the imaging right first. It just gives you confirmation that you have expansion, apposition, and luminal gain. And why that's important is I look at drug therapy based on OCT. Uh, how long I treat with antiplatelet, when I clear someone for surgery. I know if I have 90% or greater expansion without dissection, I don't need long dual antiplatelet therapy. And if I have somebody who has diffuse disease, I might treat aggressive uh, anti-lipid therapy because I know stenting is not the answer there. So stenting lets me pharmacologically treat the patient best as well. Right. And how about if we uh, talk about physiology? Is this a complementary to the imaging or separate entity? Well, you know, physiology has shown when you should do angioplasty in terms of changing somebody's outcomes for their life. But there are many instances with physiology where someone has angina and the physiology may be negative if you have an aneurysm malaria, if you have clot, um, ruptured plaque. So I think you need to be a doctor first. Imaging of physiology, why is the patient in the cath lab? Exactly. They're in the cath lab for a reason, unless you're lonely. So they're in for a reason, and if the reason is they have angina, you may not extend their life, they're not going to die, but they have a lifestyle, and medications have cost and risks and side effects. So if somebody comes to me with classical angina, and we're all pretty good historians, we know how to take a history, and the physiology is borderline, but they, on imaging, have significant disease, I think there's a pretty good case to fix that person. Right. You mentioned something very important is how you acquired imaging over the course of your practice. So what are the barriers or why people don't acquire imaging right now? I think there are several reasons why physicians don't image. It's not because it's more radiation, it's not because there's more time, it's not because it costs more or it's unsafe or there's no data. Well, that's not true. There are really a couple of reasons why people don't image. One is um, as a physician, you're in and out of the lab a lot quicker if you don't image, so it's an easy way out. And you don't recognize, if you don't do it, the advantages of it. And two, if the technolo any technology can break it, if you don't have someone to fix it on spot, you're not gonna continue with it. So I think if you had an imaging expert in your lab, in your hospital, who helped the doctor through, um, I think that would change the needle really quickly. Especially how to read the imaging. Getting the imaging is one thing, reading it is something Although, else. Although, you know, most most uh, people in their 80s who are retired know how to work an iPhone instead of a rotary phone. If you're going to tell me that an interventional cardiologist 
can't figure out how to do imaging, but your grandmother knows how to work an iPhone, that's a sad statement. Well, I would like to close with that. Thank you so much, Dr. Slofmas, for your time. Please watch this videos and other SIF conversation. I'm Shadi Reis from Scottsdale. Dr. Slofmas, thanks so much.